You are about to experience, Jackson Snyder presents. Direct from the Vero Esin Yahad, a Hebrew Nation radio original program. JSP is a variety show seeking out Jewish and Christian origins, religion, theology and history, and doing so in a fashion that is both educational and entertaining. Welcome to Jackson Snyder Presents. Charles Worth rejects the term because of what it implies. Christianity, he says, did not evolve out of a dying mother, but out of a highly sophisticated and phenomenologically complex Jewish religion and culture. Christianity was the heir of over a thousand years of traditions, both written and oral. Christianity arose in a cosmopolitan Jewish culture, which was impregnated after the exile repeatedly by influences from Babylon, Egypt, Persia, Syria, Greece, Parthia, and Rome. In short, Christian theology was capable of highly developed sophistication at a very early time and in Palestine. It is not necessary to posit a later development in the Hellenistic world outside Palestine. And I shall go on to quote him, The first generation of Jews converted to Christianity was proficient in developed and sophisticated thoughts. The earliest followers of Jesus, who were Jews, brought with them into the new Jewish movement that would be called Christian, this sophistication. The greatest development of thought in early Christianity would probably have occurred in Palestine and in the decades from 30 to 75 and not elsewhere from 75 to 150. I don't know if you can get the significance of what he's saying here. Early Christian thought did not have to move outside Palestine to be significantly affected by Greek and Roman ideas. Christology did not evolve with unexpected jumps and mutations, but it developed out of pregnant elements ready for maturation. Without undermining the obvious significant development of Christian thought and Christology from 30 to 150, in the 30s, and even during Jesus' public ministry, there were highly developed ideas. What was needed was not so much more development as transference and specification, the transference to Jesus of many of the ideas already highly developed about the Lord God and his messengers, the specification of Jesus as the one who was to come, for example, as the Messiah, as the Son of Elohim, and as the Son of Man. That was a rather difficult passage to read. After the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and the burning of the temple in 70 AD, Judaism redirected itself. The Judaism and the Jewish society that emerged after 70 AD was far different from the variegated conditions that prevailed before the Roman destruction. The post-70 period saw the triumph of rabbinic Judaism, but it is anachronistic to try to understand Christian origins in terms of rabbinic Judaism. Oh, say that again. Say that again. It is anachronistic to try to understand Christian origins in terms of rabbinic Judaism. Even though New Testament documents written after 70 AD sometimes reflect a monolithic rabbinic Judaism that did not obtain at the time of Jesus. A recent study by Columbia University's Alan F. Siegel emphasizes that two new religions emerged from the first century, Judaism as well as Christianity. And he is quoted, The time of Jesus marks the beginning of not one but two great religions of the West, Judaism and Christianity. According to conventional wisdom, the first century witnessed the beginning of only one religion, Christianity. Judaism is generally thought to have begun in the more distant past, at the time of Abraham, Moses, or even Ezra, who rebuilt the temple destroyed by the Babylonians. Judaism underwent radical religious changes in response to important historical crises. But the greatest transformation, contemporary with Christianity, was Rabbinic Judaism, which generally became the basis of the future Jewish religion. So great is the contrast between previous Jewish religious systems and Rabbinism that Judaism and Christianity can essentially claim a twin birth. It's a startling truth that the religions we know today as Judaism and Christianity were born at the same time and nurtured in the same environment. Judaism before 70 AD was filled with apocalyptic speculations reflected in the pseudepigrapha. 
in searching for Christian origins, we must be careful to seek it in pre-70 Judaism, not in post-70 Rabbinic Judaism. Amen. The roots of Rabbinic Judaism can also be found in pre-70 Judaism, but the difference between what Charles Worth calls early Judaism, that is pre-70 Judaism, and Rabbinic Judaism as it emerged after the Roman destruction of the Temple are profound. In the post-70 period, Judaism developed into a more systematized, organized, so-called normative structure of Judaism. I continue to quote, What's missing in the rabbinic writing and so pervasively characteristic in early Judaism is the thoroughgoing, categorically eschatological form and function of thought and life. In short, pre-70 Judaism, or early Judaism, as Charles Worth calls it, was filled with apocalyptic speculations and apocalypticism, of which there is relatively little evidence in later rabbinic literature, but which is abundantly evident in the pre-70 literature, narrowly for the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls, but much more broadly for Judaism in general in the Pseudepigrapha. As Charlesworth says, the Pseudepigrapha opens our eyes to a cosmos full of activity. The apocalypticism that pervades so many New Testament writings is often paralleled in contemporaneous Jewish literature. An earlier generation of scholars looked on Christian apocalypticism as sui generis, or perhaps related to Hellenistic religion outside of Palestine, muses Charlesworth. How odd it is to be told, as the previous generation of scholars told us, that early Christianity is so different from early Judaism because the Christian doctrine cannot be extracted from it. We're just beginning to penetrate this relationship, especially as a result of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the renewed interest in the Pseudepigrapha. The process of understanding is just developing. We are entering a new phase in research in early Judaism and Christian origins. Christianity's inheritance from early Judaism is not only rich, but it is complex. Put that in a nutshell, Christianity did not spring from Rabbinic Judaism. It sprang from apocalyptic Judaism, such as exemplified in both the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Codices. At the outset, we're faced with the problem of dating the Pseudepigrapha. Dating is not quite so great a problem with respect of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The community that preserved them was destroyed by the Romans in 68 AD. This so-called terminus postquem is not available for the Pseudepigrapha. The extant manuscripts are all later, much later, except for the fragments of Pseudepigrapha found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and their compositional history is complex. The objective is to get behind the texts that have survived, to strip away the layers, to see by whom and when a pseudepigraph was written, and then determine the textual influences to which it was subjected. The dating of each pseudepigraphic document must be considered separately. This gives us some idea of the task facing scholars. Sometimes there's simply not enough evidence, and the original composition cannot be confidently dated at all. Often it's difficult to determine whether a document is of Jewish or Christian origin. Most early followers of Jesus were Jews. To label them Christians may itself distort our view. Moreover, a Jewish composition may have been edited later and interpolations added from a Christian viewpoint. Yet on occasion, it may be possible to reconstruct, at least tentatively, the Jewish substratum of the document. Despite the textual difficulties, scholars have been surprisingly successful in unscrambling the history of many pseudepigraphic works. Charlesworth lists eight works that are clearly pre-Christian Jewish documents and ten more that are probably fitting into this category. Another 14 compositions are later, but contemporaneous with the New Testament writings of the second century, so should be helpful in understanding the background of these writings. First Enoch, Jubilees, and some of the testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs have been shown to be pre-Christian Jewish documents, and it took all that to get to here, something that is so well known that even cavemen know it. The three principal pre-Christian Jewish documents are One Enoch, some of the testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, and Jubilees. Jubilees is the clearest case. Fragments from 14 different copies of Jubilees have been found in the Dead Sea Caves. It is free of Christian interpolations and redactions, 
and was probably written shortly before 150 B.C., antedating the establishment of the Essene community at Qumran. First Enoch is more complicated. Fragments of it, too, have been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. These parts of the work are clearly Jewish and pre-Christian, but we have only fragments from such an early date. Since First Enoch is a composite document that may combine six separate works, including a lost book of Noah, each part of the work must be assessed separately. Nevertheless, Charlesworth tells us, the results of labors by scholars throughout the world have moved us far away from a level of exasperation or frustration when working with one Enoch. It is now clear that specialists on one Enoch at present affirm not only its Jewish character, but also its pre-Christian or pre-70 date, and that judgment pertains to all segments of of this composite work. Up until lately, as an aside, scholars were certain that the Son of Man passages, the Ben-Adam passages in Enoch, which comprise what's called the parables of Enoch, were Christian interpolations, because the term Son of Man is finally there defined divinely, but not anymore. It is pre-Christian, so we can understand exactly where Yeshua got the term Son of Man and understand what that means from Enoch. As to the testaments of the twelve patriarchs, there is less consensus. In its present and final form, it is a Christian document. Nevertheless, in Charlesworth's words, it is, quote, not a Christian composition, but a Christian redaction of earlier Jewish testaments. Indeed, fragments of the Testament of Levi and the Testament of Naphtali in Hebrew were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, assuring us that at least these two of the twelve are Jewish and pre-Christian. Charlesworth complains that the editor who was assigned publication rights to these fragments, that is, J.T. Millick, has not yet published them, so the texts themselves are unavailable to scholars. Well, this article was written in 2015, and Millick has gone on to heaven. As a Catholic priest, I'm sure he went to heaven. Charlesworth concludes, I have no qualms about stating boldly that it is highly probable that behind each one of the Twelve Testaments, in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, there is a Jewish substratum which can be reconstructed tentatively once the clearly Christian redactions and interpolations have been identified." Unquote. Thus, pseudepigraphic documents like these can be used in reconstructing Christian origins and the history of early Christianity. Note, Jewish Christianity. When we say Christianity here, we're not talking about the church down the street. The point is emphasized by the fact that only two collections of ancient Jewish documents are quoted in the New Testament. The two collections, of course, the Old Testament and the Old Testament pseudepigrapha. We may close this article with two examples of how pseudepigraphic writings are used in New Testament research. The letter of Jude is one of the so-called general epistles of the New Testament not addressed to a particular Christian community. The author of this epistle challenges the readers to contend for the true faith and inveighs against the inroads of heretics who set up divisions, perhaps a reference to an early sect of Gnostics or something. And here Jude, in verses 14 and 15, quotes the book of Enoch to show that these things have been prophesied. Jude not only says that he is quoting from Enoch, but we have a late Ethiopic version of Enoch with which to compare it. Moreover, we can be confident that this part of Enoch is Jewish and pre-Christian because a fragment of precisely this passage was found in the Dead Sea Caves, written in Aramaic, not Ethiopic, and the handwriting of this fragment allows us to date it to the first century BC. When Jude quotes Enoch, however, he makes some significant changes in the text, except for one thing. We don't know what text he was actually looking at. Jude alters the text of Enoch so that the prophecy of the coming of the sovereign, which Jude takes to be a prophecy of Jesus, has been fulfilled, rather than, as in Enoch, that it will be fulfilled. According to Jude, Enoch prophesies, Behold, Yahweh came with his holy myriads to execute judgments against all. But Enoch in fact prophesied, Behold, he will arrive with the myriads of the holy ones to execute judgment upon all. As Charlesworth says, For Jude, Messiah came and accomplished his task. In the light of this, he will return, as Enoch had prophesied about Elohim. Jude freely alters the text he quotes 
within what was regarded as acceptable bounds to prove his interpretation. Again, though, we don't know what text of Enoch Jude was reading. Moreover, not only does Jude change the future tense in Enoch's to the past tense, but kurios, Lord, Yahweh, is used instead of he. Thus, Jude has made a decidedly Christian adaptation of First Enoch by changing he to Lord Kurios. Jude may be applying a prophecy of the eschatological coming of Elohim to Messiah's first coming, but also to the, to the parousia, his anticipated imminent second coming. In addition, Jude refers to his holy ones, while Enoch actually says the holy ones. In short, Messiah possesses the holy legions. They are his. Charlesworth tells us, as most interpolations are alterations by Christians of early Jewish writings, the alteration is caused by Christology, that is, the study of who Messiah is. He, that is Messiah, is the Lord, or Kyrios, or Yahweh. In most cases, as in Jude 14 and 15, the alteration of an earlier Jewish quotation is precisely because of the belief in the advent of the one who was to come. The commitment to Jesus as the Messiah, the Messiah shifted inherited parallel verbs and nouns according to the light shown upon the text, altering these traditions like light passing through a prism. Thus we see how early Jewish theology was transformed into Christology. Don't be messed up by the term Christology. It simply means the study of who the Messiah is and what he is. One more point is to be noted. Jude tells us that this passage from Enoch is a prophecy. Hence, it is certain the author of Jude considered the document Enoch inspired. Charlesworth asks, How can Christians discard as insignificant or apocryphal a document that is clearly pre-Christian, Jewish, and quoted as prophecy by an author who has been canonized? Now, when we try to understand why Enoch is not in the canon, there you have it. That is, Charlesworth is making a point that it should be. The example we have just considered is quite precise and detailed. Our second and last example is more general. It simply specifies in one respect the growing recognition of the Jewish background to some terms that took on significant Christological meanings in early Christian communities. The most prominent of these is the title, Son of Man. Just mentioned that before. A title the early church accorded to Jesus. And I might say that Jesus accorded to himself over a hundred times. The term is frequently used in the Old Testament, but without the messianic implications, it is accorded in the New Testament, except most notably in Daniel. To understand when and why the Son of Man took on a Christological connotation, we must look not only to Daniel, but equally to Enoch, or most, more so. Daniel really doesn't give us much, but Enoch gives us lots. Although it was once disputed, it's now clear that the phrase as it appears in one Enoch is not an emendation, but is part of the original composition. It there refers to a celestial figure. Moreover, as Charlesworth says, the text is clear that Enoch himself is said to be the Son of Man. Just how Enoch influenced the early followers of Jesus is not yet clear, but it seems highly likely that it did. I might add one little note here. The verse that tells us that Enoch is the son of man in First Enoch is an interpolation. It doesn't belong there. I wonder if they just overlooked that. One scholar, George Nicholsburg, has suggested that Luke may have been personally acquainted with the man who translated Enoch into Greek. Indeed, it may have been Luke himself who translated Enoch into Greek. So close are some of the similarities. Hmm. In ways such as these do pseudepigrapha make their impress felt. Modern scholars ignore them at their own peril. Now a little more about Father J.T. Millick, who took nearly 30 years to publish the fragments from the pseudepigraphic book of Enoch, found in the Dead Sea Scroll caves in the 1950s. During those years, other scholars were not allowed to study and write about these highly significant documents which affect our understanding of the history of Judaism and Christianity. Did you hear that? While Millick had them, no one else was allowed to study them. That's why Professor Eisenman worked so hard to get those Dead Sea Scrolls out of the hands of these guys and into the hands of the public. Why couldn't other scholars study and write about them? The incredulous layperson will ask. 
because of a foolish scholarly convention which states that until a scholar assigned to publish a manuscript actually publishes, no one else can do so, even if it takes nearly 30 years. It's hard to justify such a ridiculous convention, and many scholars have spoken out against it in recent years. The usual justification for it is that it encourages a thorough study of a document before rushing into print. Oh, I kept close watch on the Dead Sea Scroll Wars and the Dead Sea Scroll Deception back in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and on through about 93. Very interested in it. And it's quite something that Professor Eisenman, now his last book out, I think, he talks all about this deception and how it kept him back in his studies and so many other scholars as well, and that he had to work nearly single-handedly to get them out of the hands of these guys. The person who wrote this article is another one that claims that he got the Dead Sea Scrolls out of the hands of scholars too, that is Herschel Shanks. Both of those guys wrote a book on how they did it. In the case of the Enoch fragments, Millick announced to the scholarly world as early as the 1950s that the fragments of 1 Enoch 37 to 71, that's important, that's a Son of Man passage, that he held under wraps would be shown in his publication to be Christian, not Jewish, and that this section of the book could be dated sometimes after the New Testament period. Again, in the words of Professor Charles Worth, since the 50s, J.T. Millick promised us he could prove that First Enoch 37 to 71 is not Jewish, but indeed a Christian composition that considerably postdates the New Testament period. Unquote. As a result, scholars in effect called a moratorium on any use of this section of Enoch to elucidate Christian origins in early Judaism. Why, they couldn't get the book from him. So, so dumb. When Millick finally published his Enoch fragments, his interpretations, as well as the fragments, were finally subjected to scrutiny by his fellow scholars, and almost all of them concluded that Millick was wrong. To revert once again to the words of Professor Charlesworth, it became obvious that Millick had not proved his position Repeatedly, the specialists on First Enoch have come out in favor of the Jewish nature of this section of First Enoch and its first century origin, and probably pre-70 date. The list of specialists on First Enoch arguing for this position has become overwhelmingly impressive. Isaac, Nicholsburg, Stone, Nib, Anderson, Black, Vanderkam, Greenfield, and Souter. The consensus communis is unparalleled in almost any other area of research. No specialist now argues that 1st Enoch 37 to 71 is Christian and postdates the first century. So now, after nearly 30 years, scholars can once again look to Enoch to help elucidate such concepts as the Son of Man, which figures so prominently in New Testament sources as well as in the text of Enoch. Now look, you cannot understand what Yahshua is talking about when he calls himself the Son of Man, if he's calling himself that. You must have that section of Enoch. And again, get in touch with me. I'll send you a brand new translation of it, and it'll be yours free. But I got to know how to get to you to get it, to get it to you. A seminar of leading Enoch scholars from around the world recently concluded that, quote, it would have been far better for Millick to have published the Dead Sea Scroll Fragments of Enoch with a succinct introduction two decades earlier, but rather than wait until his full study of Enoch had been completed. I just call that lazy. Lazy and grasping. Gluttony of texts. And that ends the article. If you could hang in through that, I'm sure that you got as much meat out of it as I did. And again, that is, uh, article is by Herschel Shanks. It comes from Bible Review in 1987. And another article, don't let Pseudepigrapha Scare You, from Bible Review, also in 1987. Now you can freely read Enoch, and you can know that it originated in Hebrew, Aramaic, that it predates the New Testament, and what's in there about the Son of Man is not a Christian interpolation, although they have yet to find a fragment of that section at the Dead Sea Scrolls. My friend, uh, you can get your word in too. Contact us at yahad.me. You'll find an easy contact form there. This way we don't miss anything. You got something to say? Well, go on, say it. We'll tell other people as well if you like. 
and probably sent you a nice gift. Yahweh be with you. Make good choices. And don't forget to pray for us.